Um, so this is the seventh session or the second session for this quarter. Um, thanks for all the new people who have signed up. We have some people from, more people from nursing and medicine and other schools undergraduate. So it's great to see that uh, in this class interdisciplinary aspect. So today we're going to talk about chronic diseases and general medical issues in homeless populations. So first off, I want to do some housekeeping. Um, so if you miss a discussion session or if you just signed up for the class, you'll want to go to the web course website and the easiest way to get there is with that link on the bottom. So health and homelessness, it's pretty simple. So go there and you'll be able to look at the schedule, the uh, bios for each speaker and whatnot. And so for each discussion session that you miss, you want to watch the video. They're all recorded, so you'll be able to watch them and the slides will most likely be provided as well. And then there'll be a makeup exercise. So it's just a short, you know, five question thing to see if you've watched the video. And then also the discussion session evaluation, which is what you complete here. It's what we pass out. So if you miss one of those while you're here, you can just do that online as well. And I'll, I'll take note of that. Any questions on that? Um, so the first opportunities for volunteering if you're a dental student right now, are the 45th Street Homeless Youth Clinic, and the spring quarter dates uh, start this week. So if you've signed up and you've been approved uh, through the Office of Educational Partnerships, then you can participate in those, uh, those dates. The clinic hours are six to nine, so just a heads up if you want to start getting your hours. Uh, surveys and the attendance are out there. It's important that I get the attendance because then at the end of the quarter, you'll get a polite email that says, where were you? Um, and the, the surveys are always nice to have for me and then for the speaker as well. So I'll go ahead and introduce Nancy. Nancy Sugg is an associate professor of medicine at the UW Medical Center, medical director of Pioneer Health Clinic and Harborview's Downtown Homeless Programs, and a primary care internist. Her clinical and research interests are health care for vulnerable populations, interpersonal violence, and chronic disease management. Please let me welcome Nancy Sugg. Okay, can everybody hear me okay? Health speaker, all right, let me know if you can't. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here. I think this is the first time I've done a lecture for the dental school. And I have to say I always um, feel a little bad for the dental groups in general because whenever cuts happen, like DSHS cuts, it always seems that adult dental is low-hanging fruit and seems to get cut right away, which as we all know is very short-sighted um, when it comes to not only having a poor hygiene and painful teeth cause nutrition problems, but also as we learn more about chronic inflammation and things like heart disease, it's becoming more and more clear that this is a, a neglected area, especially when it comes to uh, the legislature recognizing the importance of it. So I'm going to talk about care of vulnerable populations. Um, I have been at Pioneer Square Clinic for 20 years. Our front door faces the back door of the Union Gospel Mission. So whenever you're down there doing your dental uh, program, stop over and say hello uh, if it's during the day and we're around. We're always happy to have more connections with dental because our patients really need it. Homelessness. So estimates are that there are about 3 million homeless people in the United States and you know that's bad because it's hard to be without a home but the other reason that it's really bad is when you look at the average age of death for someone who's homeless it's 42 to 52 years old. So it's clearly a significant health problem not just a social issue for people. So we'll start with a pop quiz. Where's Skid Row? How did that term start? Downtown LA. Oh, no. Any other ideas? It is a Seattle term. So when they talk about Skid Row in LA or Skid Row in New York City, it is not Skid Row. We are the original Skid Row. Does anybody know what, what street it is exactly? It is Yesler. So in the old days, they logged on the hilltop and they skidded the logs down to the sawmill, which was down in the Pioneer Square area. And so all of the brothels and bars and all of that popped up near the sawmill because that wasn't great property. Now it's where all our great clubs are at night. So when you talk about going down Skid Row, you're skidding down Yesler to the bars. Okay, so let's talk about homelessness. So 
everybody has a different vision that flashes in their mind when they think of homelessness. And I think of it in sort of two ways. There are those who are truly homeless and those who are marginally housed. So the truly homeless are pretty easy. They're in the shelter, they're in tent city, they're in the doorways, they're under a bridge, they're in their car. They are clearly without homes. But there are also a lot of people that are marginally housed. And people that are couch surfers, or we call it doubled up. So these are people that might be staying on their cousin's couch. They don't pay rent, it's not their permanent address. Federal guidelines do not consider that homeless. But when you talk about pro pro providing medical care, we think of it as homeless. Other things to think about are there are plenty of people that at the beginning of the month when they have a little money will check into a hotel for a week or two till their money runs out and then they may be back in the shelters. So they clearly are not housed, they don't have permanent housing. And then there are folks who go in and out of jail and there are folks who are in transitional housing. So transitional housing is a little more secure than shelter but it is not permanent housing and it usually has a finite uh, period of time in which you can be in it. Okay, so have any of you done the one night count? I heard there were participants, great. So the one night count has been going on, at least in Seattle, for about two decades. And what it is is across the nation on one night of the year, uh, the large urban areas try to get an idea of how many homeless people are in their city. And it helps with funding sources and just to give them an idea of what happens. So. Um, there's a count that happens. So the shelter and tr transitional housing count is fairly easy because they have demographics and they just go and say, okay, on this night, how many people were in your shelter and how many people were in transitional housing? And then what they do is that they take all of King County, so we're talking about Kent and Federal Way and Bothell and Kenmore and Bellevue, and they divide it up in grids and they have teams go out between 2 a.m. and 5 a.m. and they just count people. Who's in a car, who's under a bridge, they don't wake people up and ask them how old they are. They just kind of get a count of how many are out there. Um, so I don't have the 2013 data, but the 2012, now this is unsheltered, so these are people sleeping out January of 2012. There are about 25 to 2,600 people sleeping out. We know this is an underestimate because it doesn't count people that are in the deep woods or people that are couch surfing that night or people that happen to be in jail that night. So it is an underestimate. So this is the full report. So if you look at shelter, emergency shelters, transitional housing, and without shelter, it's 8,800 people uh, in, the, in the count in 2012. And I think the count this year was about 2% more than last year. So who is in the shelter? So if we look at racially, this last <coughs> column over here is uh, Seattle King County uh, demographics. So if you look at Afro-American, five, five to six percent of the general population, but it's 36 percent of our shelter population. Hispanic is about double of what we see in the general population, and Native American is about four times. What are the age groups? So as you would predict, 26 to 54 is the majority of people who are in the shelters. But I think the real sad piece on this, on this slide is when you look at those under the age of 17, 30 percent of our sheltered homeless population are in that age group under 17 and 13 percent are under the age of five and so when people think about homeless I don't think they realize the number of kids that are actually homeless either with their families or on their own and then as we talked about if you look at that last line over the age of 65 very few people very few people live to be that old and be chronically homeless uh, primary source of income, this is sort of the alphabet soup of all the different types of benefits people can be on. I think the thing to take away from this slide is that 27% of homeless people receive some sort of public benefits for disabilities. And what that speaks to is the disease burden in this population. Um, the other thing that I think is interesting is that 19% of people are employed, because we always think of people as not being employed when they're homeless, and it's really not true. This is a great website, homelessinfo.org. They're the ones that help out with the one night count. It's the Seattle King County Coalition on Homelessness and a great place to go if you want some more information. Okay, so let's talk about homeless realities. Um, first off, it's very hard to remain clean and sober in a homeless environment. It is very easy to score drugs at almost any of the sites where the shelters are out on the streets. And one of the hardest things I see is when people really have struggled to try to remain sober um, they may go into treatment for 21 days and come back out and where they go to is back to the shelter environment where it's very difficult to, to ma maintain sobriety. 
Violence is a constant part of life. We talk about a lot of our patients having PTSD because of some traumatic thing that happened in the past, but the reality is homelessness by itself is a source of PTSD. That daily constant fear of not knowing where you're going to sleep or not knowing how you're going to eat and the violence that is there on the street. Robbery is a constant part of life for people. People get rolled all the time, all their possessions are stolen, people get the glucometer stolen over and over and over again. And one of the things that are stolen are shoes. So people don't take their shoes off at night because if they do, they're likely not to have them the next day. So people will sleep with their shoes on for two or three weeks in a row, their shoes get wet, you try to peel their shoe off and part of their skin comes with it. It's, it's a really difficult part of life. Conflicting agendas. Um, Medical care often falls very low on the list of what people need to deal with that day. They wake up and they need to think about where am I going to eat, where am I going to sleep, I have a court date, I have to do, go do something, and if they get around to it, they may end up making a medical appointment. If I have a patient and they have an appointment with me, and they have a, an appointment with the Seattle Housing Authority at the same time, they better be at the Seattle Housing Authority, because it takes 18 to 24 months to get housing. So their priority that day had better be to show up at housing. And sometimes people get labeled non-compliant because they miss their appointments, but I think the one thing people need to look at is they have other agendas that sometimes have to take priority. Water fountains and toilets are hard to find, so when I have people that are discharging patients from the hospital and they want them to take a medicine with large amounts of water three or four times a day, probably not going to happen. You're going to put somebody on a diuretic like hydrochlorothiazide, they're going to pee a lot. It's going to be a real problem for them. So things like that you really have to think about. You know, you're going to send somebody out on an antibiotic that you have to take with food four times a day. Not going to happen. So little nuances like that you really need to pay attention to. Showers are limited and bathtubs are non-existent. People come out from having their hemorrhoid surgery and they're supposed to do sitz baths for, you know, two weeks. Not going to happen. And showers, there's places like the urban, um, urban Rest Stop and the Compass Hygiene Center. So at the urban rest stop, people get in line at 5.30 in the morning to get their ticket for their shower at 10. And then they can take a shower and they can wash their clothes. So if they have an appointment with me that morning at 10, they're going to be in the shower. And that's really where they're going to need to be if they're going to actually go to work that day. Three meals a day are hard to come by. So if you go to seattle.gov and you hit, you can't see it very well, but it says hot meals resources directory. There's a huge list of hot meals in all of Seattle King County. And you would think, wow, it is really easy to get a meal if you're homeless. But then if you start drilling down, what you see, like Bread of Life Mission, which is not far from the Union Gospel Mission, they have hot meals, dinner, Monday through Saturday, but attendance at chapel is required. Cathedral Kitchen, they have an evening meal Monday through Friday, but you have to start lining up at 3.30, and you have to be clean and sober. And Chief Seattle Club, which is a great organization, um, is open for breakfast Monday through Friday, but it's American Indians only. So yes, there's a lot of resources, but a lot of them have specific populations that they serve. And what you will notice is Monday through Friday, there's a fair number of meals. When it comes to the weekend, not so many. And you'd have to be really quite good at getting around Seattle if you're gonna try to hit two or three meals a day to do that. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Literacy is a huge issue. Um, I have, had many patients that I have known for years that are illiterate and I never knew it. They could sign their name, they could go over instructions, they could sort of really give me a sense that they understood what I was showing to them, but they had a very low literacy level. So I think one of the things we always have to keep in mind is that people may not be able to read all those nice glossy handouts that we give folks. Another thing that's becoming more and more prevalent in the literature is math literacy. When I tell my diabetic patient, okay, you're gonna take 36 units of your long-acting insulin, and then before each meal, you're gonna take five units, but if your sugar is between 300 and 350, you're gonna take an additional six units before the meal. That's higher level math functioning, and a lot of people really cannot do that, even people that have graduated 12th grade. And so we take for granted that people can understand that type of instructions. And I think it's really good to step back. And you know, I even start with, show me on the syringe where's 36 units. I just need to know the basics. Can you even figure that out with the little dots that are on the syringe? 
And then health literacy really is about how do people understand how diseases work? And we again, we sort of assume because we come from this medical culture that we all share the same ideas of health literacy and it's not really true. And it's, sometimes it's as basic as can you read your pill bottle? But, but it also may be what is your understanding of diabetes? And some people tell me, oh, I just have to never have sugar. Um, even though they'll eat a huge plate of white rice and not get the concept of how those two things go together. Communication is spotty. Um, some people have cell phones. Often they'll have a, a cell phone with minutes on it. And so they may or may not take my call depending on how many minutes they have on their cell phone at that moment. Some people are very savvy and access the library and I can reach them on email. And so that's often a, a point of contact. But I really emphasize to people to try to have a way to get hold of your patients. For me, it's always Friday night at 8 p.m. and their potassium is 2.8 when I get called from the lab and suddenly I'm scrambling to try to figure out how do I get hold of this person who's homeless and maybe living under a bridge. So it's good to think about what other ways can we get in touch with you if we need to. And then lack of family or friend support makes medical follow through really difficult. Studies have really shown that a person really hears maybe a third of what's told to them in a medical type setting. And it's always nice because we often have family members who come with us or somebody else that can actually hear what's being said, especially if it might be bad news or something, a really difficult diagnosis like diabetes. And so that lack of having that structure for people is also makes it very difficult for some people to follow through. And finally, a good bed for some people is a mat on the floor two inches from the next. This is uh, St. Martin de Poor shelter. It's a shelter for men over the age of 50. It is a really nice shelter. But you can see at night, it is really close quarters. Once you have your bed at St. Martin's, you will always have your bed as long as you show up each night. Um, so at, over time, people don't show up and people move. And what happens is those beds are by the um, back there that are kind of a little more isolated, those are the prime beds. And as you're there longer, you move towards that bed and you don't want to lose it. That's the best spot in the whole shelter. So you have to realize that this is life for a lot of people. Okay. So I'm going to talk a bit about diabetes um, because it's very common. And also because among people who are housed, educated, and have access to food, it is a very difficult condition to manage. So when you think about, we're going to take that very difficult condition to manage, and now you're going to be homeless, how is that going to change how you're going to provide medical management to folks? So the first thing I have to think about is, what is my goal with this person? There are some homeless people that will be, I will be able to control. We don't really tight control anymore, but you know, we're trying to get that A1C somewhere around seven. And there will be people that can do a lot of changes in lifestyle and a lot of medicines and reach that goal. Um, there are some people that I just want to keep them out of the hospital. And if I can keep their blood sugars between 80 and 400, we are good. And that's all I'm aiming for. I am not aiming for anything more than that. Sometimes I'm even happy if I can keep it so it doesn't read high, high, high on the glucometer when I check it. But as long as I can keep them out of the hospital, that's really what we're aiming for. So A1C is a glycosylated hemoglobin. So in your red blood cells, the hemoglobin sucks up the sugar that's in your blood. So every 120 days, your red blood cells are turning over. So what it does is it basically gives you a number that averages what your blood sugars were for the last, 30 day, or last 90 days. And please feel free to ask questions as we go along. Okay, so when I'm thinking about diabetes, the first questions I need to be asking is about food. I need to know how often do they eat. I will tell you that most homeless people eat once a day. If you're going to eat once a day, what are you going to eat? You're going to eat carbs and you're going to eat fat. The two things I won't particularly want you eating. But that's what you're going to eat because that's what's going to hold you for 24 hours. So that's it. You know, I have to deal with the fact that that's the reality and we're going to have to work our medical management around that. What do they eat? Sometimes if they eat at the shelters, different groups will bring food in. And so one night it may be bologna sandwiches and the next night it may be lasagna. So how predictable is the fact that A, you're going to have food and B, what kind of food is it and how much is it going to be? Uh, I need to talk to them about how they're going to deal with hypoglycemia. I need to make sure that if they happen to miss a meal, they're in line, but they run out of food before they get to the front of the line. How are we going to deal with that if you've already taken your insulin? And do they know what to eat? So a lot of times when I talk to the medical residents in my clinic, 
um, about referring people to nutrition. They're like, well, why would I do that? They eat in the soup line. They have no control over what they're going to eat. So there's some very good reasons, though, why you start that piece early. And one is they can make limited choices. You can take half as much syrup. You can maybe forego that pastry that gets put out at night that's the leftovers from Starbucks. Or just eat half of it. You know, let's talk portion control. Um, they need to start understanding really what a heart healthy diet is because the hope is at some point this person will no longer be homeless and we know that that education piece takes a long time to really start making some inroads. Uh, we need to talk about, you know, we talk about fresh foods, fruits and vegetables. Obviously they're not going to be eating that if they're going to go 24 hours till the next meal. But they need to start thinking in terms of, you know, how we can do that given how costly fresh vegetables and fruits are. And then the availability of poor food choices. I walk downtown and you know, you're thinking about that salad you're going to get and you walk by one of the little grocery stores and that fried chicken comes wafting out at you and that fried chicken costs like 79 cents and a banana costs a dollar, you're going to get that fried chicken. So it's really easy to make very poor food choices downtown in Seattle. I'm not going to belabor this very much, but I'm just going to say, um, there's different types of insulin and depending on what my agenda is for that particular person, I will choose which type of insulin I'm going to do. Sometimes I pre-fill for people if I'm worried about their ability to see their syringe, so I use NPH to do that. And at the very bottom, the DOT is directly observed therapy. We have a few patients. Um, usually there are very schizophrenic patients and we have them come in Monday through Friday and I give them long-acting glargine, which kind of gives them some basal insulin to last 24 hours. I know they're going to run high on the weekends because they're not going to have any insulin, but they come back on Monday morning and we correct for that. And I will keep them out of the hospital. And that is not gold standard medicine, but it is good enough for what we need to accomplish at this time with the person. So you just have to really be creative about <coughs> really how you're going to reach your goals. There's other logistics things that I think are important that you have to think about. Um, what they're going to do with their needles and, and checking their blood sugar and things like that. I had this one patient, um, really sweet guy, was a concert pianist. I mean, he was educated, you know, he would play at Nordstrom's in, uh, in their piano. And he drank too much. And he ended up in the shelters. And he had diabetes. And I knew he was smart. And I knew he understood what I was saying to him, but he would not check his blood sugars. And I would go over and over and over with my education. And finally one day I was just like, I give up. Why aren't you checking your blood sugars? And he said, okay, they don't let you have needles out in the shelter. You have to go in the bathroom. If you go in the bathroom, the sink is this little pedestal sink with a little ledge. He said, you take your glucometer out and you put your stuff on this little ledge and it falls on the floor and it scatters everywhere. And I did that so many times, I just said, forget it. I'm like, okay, now I understand why you don't check your blood sugars. It made perfect sense. Um, so some of these little logistics things to us that seem like not a big deal can, can really get in your way of, of taking care of folks. Um, storage, you can open your insulin and keep it in your pack. It you used to say you had to refrigerate it. You do not have to refrigerate it. It's good for 28 days after you open it. Just don't stick it really deep in your pack next to the body heat so it gets too hot. Um, but as long as they kind of keep it to the outside of their thing, they can have their insulin out for 28 days and they don't need to worry about that. Um, but as we talked about, things do get stolen and we do need to think about literacy, things like literacy and cognitive abilities to take in what we were talking about. Okay, mental illness. Um, just like dental resources are becoming scarce, mental health resources are also becoming scarce. There are a number of um, Health, mental health teams downtown. Healthcare for the Homeless is one that's run out of Harborview, and we're downtown. The Downtown Emergency Service Center has a mental health team, the host and SAGE teams. And then there's community mental health centers for people that are tiered to needing higher level mental health care, and that would be things like Sound Mental Health, Community Psychiatric Services, and Navos. Um, People that are tiered to the higher level have a case manager, and I really encourage people to figure out who that case manager is and to be in touch with them, because sometimes that is the most stabilizing person in the person's life. And if you're trying to get hold of them or you're trying to set up a procedure for the patient and you need somebody to kind of help make sure they get to their appointments, that may be the key person that you're going to want to talk to. Um, payees are important. There's people that are on like Social Security and 
for whatever reason because of substance abuse or mental health issues, they are not felt to be able to take care of their own money, so they will have a payee who will give them a certain amount of money each day and make sure their rent gets paid or whatever gets paid. And those are also people that are important to know about and work with because sometimes what they'll say is, yeah, you can have your money for the day, but you need to go down to Pioneer Square and get your insulin shot first and then come back and then we can give you your money for the day and kind of help us with that. And then the challenge is just the lack of supportive housing is really hard on people. There's a concept of housing first, which came out a number of years ago, which is the idea that you house people first. You don't make them sober up or start, stop substance abusing or get on their psych meds and when they're stable then they can have housing. But that you need to provide people housing because it's a stabilizing platform from which you can do those other things. And I have to say, two decades or so ago, I was kind of agnostic about that. I thought, eh, well, it kind of works until they you know, throw their television out their front window and then it sort of falls apart. But over the years, I have seen the supportive housing model work and it, it really is true. If you don't have that sort of level playing field of housing, it is very difficult to do much of anything else. Dealing with people that are very mentally ill, I think there's a few things that work really well. One is having somewhat of an open access model because when people are needing or willing to engage in health care, you want to be able to be open and accessible to them. That doesn't mean just, you know, you can't have a crazy schedule that's out of control, but you need to have enough flexibility that when one of my patients shows up that the front desk knows is really schizophrenic and really diabetic, we pull them back and we check their blood sugar and we make sure they get seen because you really want to be able to capture people when they're ready to work. That said, there's limit setting and you know at the clinic where we're at you know if people are um, verbally abusive if people are threatening if people do anything that would put people in harm's way they are out of the clinic and it is well known that we draw a very straight line about that and that we will call the Seattle Police Department if your behavior becomes too egregious so you can't take the, the stance of oh they're mentally ill so we're gonna you know accept some of this behavior you know there has to be a certain amount of behavior um, leveling in the clinic to keep everybody safe. We do a multidisciplinary ap approach at our clinic, so we have uh, primary care, acute care, pharmacy, um, social work, psychiatry, all on site. So it's kind of a one-stop shopping model, so we're able to kind of help people through a lot of different things all in one place. They don't have to go to six different areas to get care. And then one of the newest things is integrated services. So as we have psychiatry integrated into our primary care model, we also are integrated. So DESC Mental Health, we have a primary care provider there. So that people that will only go to their mental health center can also access primary care at those sites. And then challenging behavior. So impulse control, um, you know, some of that is part and parcel of people's mental health. Uh, issues and you will realize that you know if they're going to put the day old um, Starbucks pastries out they're going to eat them that's just going to be what it is and you just sort of work your management plan around that disorganized thinking is kind of part and parcel of schizophrenia diagnosis and so when people say oh they just need to show up to their appointment it's like well it's a little harder to do when they have disorganized thinking baseline and they're untreated um, and so part of that is really setting reasonable self-management goals. For some of my patients, a reasonable self-management goal is show up for your next appointment. And they show up for the next appointment, I'm like, okay, we have really made some inroads with this. So I think it's important not to overwhelm people with you need to do this, this, and this, and this with your diabetes, but to really start taking very small steps and set really manageable goals for folks. Okay, alcohol and substance abuse. What is this person's drug of choice? Meth, meth mouth. If I could tell you the number of 26 year olds that had a mouth that looked like this that I've seen at clinic, and their brain is not far behind with what meth is doing with it. Um, alcohol, so one of the things we uh, always go round and round about is, uh, is alcohol when people come in for inpatient treatment because sometimes the surgeons and, and other people are just like, let's just put them on an alcohol drip and because we know they're going to withdraw and we know they're going to drink when they leave and you know th this will shorten their inpatient stay if we do this and the answer to that is if we think alcohol is bad for people alcohol is bad for people and we need to stay on message and we need to do it every time and I know you've seen this person in the emergency room 150 times but you're going to stay on message because you never know at what crossroads they will actually 
stop drinking. And I have had people that I have followed for 15 years that I would swear up and down were never ever going to stop drinking. Just kind of gave up on them and they did. And who knows what happens when they reach that crossroad, but you want to stay on message when they do. So not everybody's ready to quit. So I often talk about, well, let's, if we can't quit, let's see if we can at least cut back. And so these are just some harm, you know, there's no safe, necessarily safe amount of alcohol. But for men, no more than four at a session, no more than 14 per week. For women, no more than three, three or less at any one time, uh, less than seven per week. And a drink is 12 ounces of beer. Many of my patients will say, I only had three beers today, but they were all 24 ounces when they had them. Five ounces of wine or one and a half ounces of whiskey. Um, I really encourage people to go to AA meetings. I talk to people about what's made them, help them stay sober in the past. If my patient says, I was sober for two years, to me, that is great because that tells me this is a person who I'm likely going to be able to help to maintain their sobriety. And so I talk to people about when you were sober, what was going on at that point in your life, and what can we sort of put into place that may help to recreate what helped with that in the past. Substance abuse, know what they're using. I'm going to run through this really quickly. Crack is still king. It's the most, uh, most of what we see is still cocaine use. Um, Prescription drugs, uh, fortunately our death rates from those have been going down in recent years. Um, it's still a big issue among uh, teenagers. Heroin, uh, the purity of our heroin is pretty lousy. It's like five to 10% of what you get when you get heroin is actually heroin. Um, and occasionally though, a little bit more purity heroin will come into town and we'll start having overdoses because people are used to five or 10% and suddenly it's 30%. Um, methamphetamine is number two, still s sort of plateaued out, but still definitely there. Marijuana, 50% um, of people entering treatment are under the age of 18, and three quarters of them are male. So this is an issue, uh, especially among the young. Ecstasy, mollies, and legal E, we see some, but really not very much. Bath salts, which have nothing to do with bathing, um, otherwise known as cat, we really don't see very much here. And the synthetic marijuana, spice and K2, and the angel dust PCP, we don't really see that much. We see it some, but really not. It's really prescription drugs, cocaine and meth, and some heroin. But you also need to know what else they're using. And this is where we often run into trouble. How many are familiar with levamisole? So levamisol is a drug that's used to treat parasites and it's also used for cancer treatment. And it's also cut into the cocaine. So 70% of cocaine in Seattle King County is cut with levamisol. So what happens when people use this cancer drug along with their cocaine is they drop their white count dramatically and they go into sepsis and die fairly quickly. Or they get a horrible vasculitis that causes discoloration of the tip of their nose and their earlobes um, that every time they use, you can tell because the tip of their nose and their earlobes will start to turn purple. So this is a huge um, issue for people in Seattle King County. But there's all kinds of other stuff in the drugs that they use. Diltiazem, lidocaine, amitriptyline, antibiotics, talc, sugar, flour, starch, cotton, and every now and then we get a little botulism thrown in and we have an outbreak of botulism. So it's not always just about what drugs, it's about what else they're doing. So I have time to actually talk to people about how do you afford the habit. I could not afford a $300 a day habit. So I need to know are they trading sex for drugs, you know, what else is going on when they're doing that. And again, harm reduction is usually the best model to use. I'm going to skip through a couple things. So real quick here, if you're talking about problem list, if you know who their case manager is, put their name and phone number down. And don't just put homeless. Really say where are they staying because if you need to get in touch with them about something, you're going to want to know. Even if they say I live under the bridge, it's like which bridge? I put that in the problem list. Where can I find you if I need to get hold of you? And I'm going to really quickly talk about resources. Crisisclinic.org. Um, if you go to the website, you have to dig around a little bit, but if you hit the King County 211 button and then hit that homeless and housing and homeless button, it'll get you to an area where you can get these really nice brochures that talk to you about all the homeless services. And these are kept up to date, so it's like where you can get meals, where can you get clothes, where can you take a shower. So these are really nice to have. So if you happen to be in a, in a setting where you don't have a social worker handy, I would start looking at that website. Medical respite is uh, run by Harborview with the help of uh, King County Public Health. This is for people that are um, 
too sick to go back to shelter life, but not sick enough to need to be in the hospital. So it's a place that people can go and continue recovering. We can give IV antibiotics there. People can get complex wounds dressed. We have chemical dependency counselor on site, mental health counselors. So again, people are at a crossroads. They're very sick. They're about to return back to their homeless life. And it's kind of a point in time to begin to talk to people about what can happen. And the contact pager number is there. And I'm going to skip through because we're getting close to the end. I can talk about 1811 if people are interested. We have, through Harborview, nurses at the Downtown Emergency Service Center, Angeline's Opportunity Place, which is at the YWCA for Homeless Women, St. Martin de Poor's, Compass Hygiene, and the Adult Service Center. So there are Harborview nurses there on site, uh, not always full time, but at least part time. So if you're looking for somebody or you need information about something, really great nurses to know about getting hold of. And the nurses can help uh, locate people. They can check their blood sugar. They can do education. They can make sure they get back to their imaging that they need to get done. And so I'm going to skip through that. And I think I'm going to stop. I can talk a little bit more. We have Pioneer Square Clinic, like I said, is right behind UGM. We have a small clinic at 3rd Avenue, which is co-located with the YWCA Women's Shelter. And then we have a small clinic at the Needle Exchange, where we deal mainly with um, cellulitis and abscesses for folks. Um, Mary's Place is not part of Harborview, but it's a, also a really great homeless um, resource for women. They do a lot of work and they have nurses based at their site. Lots of community health clinics that also um, help take care of the homeless. I do want to talk quickly about neighbor care. They have a new homeless clinic in Ballard for folks. And they also have the housing health outreach team. And these are for formerly homeless people that are now housed. The nurses actually go in their shelter, go into their houses and make sure that they are keeping up with their medical problems so that they don't have a derailment because their medical problems get out of control. And I think I'm going to stop there. What questions can I answer? Yes. And we also have had um, outreach at St. Mary's Place. And we did uh -huh. some uh, screening and uh, flight application in conjunction with the medical school's uh, uh, quick care. Place. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, Mary's Place is really great, and it's especially good for women that are really ready to take steps to try to get out of homelessness. They are very set up to, to help people. Um, so there's quite a few services. This is Thomas, who uh, a respite is named after. Thomas spent two decades at Downtown Emergency Service Center, and he'd leave at 7 o'clock in the morning and come back at 5.30, just so none of the case managers could ever interact with him. He has some mental health problems. He uh, finally ended up in respite with uh, some wounds and spent some time there, got to know the nurses and the mental health staff, and they got him not only out of respite but into housing uh, and really stabilized quite a bit in his life. I talked to his doc the other day, and I said, so you know, how's he doing with his other medical issues? He said, well, he hasn't let me draw blood yet, but that's what we'll do our next decade to work on that. So that's who the, our respite is named after Thomas. So there's, um, there's a lot of really good de-escalation programs um, that we deal with. So when we talk about de-escalating situations like that, I mean, the first key is you want to recognize the sign of when people are escalating, because you'd really like to get it before it gets out of hand. So if you start seeing people are really agitated, um, they're talking rapidly, they just seem to not be able to listen, it's really good to have usually one person you know, in contact, kind of being the main speaker and talking to them and trying to have them to, to de-escalate, to find out really what it is that's either frustrating them or making them angry and what we could offer them as alternatives if we can't do particularly what, what they want to do. One of the big things I do talk to people about though is your own personal safety and you really do want to be very conscious of people's body language and making sure that there's space between you and the person who's, who's escalating. Um, then if that person, the one person who's sort of been chosen to try to de-escalate, 
cannot get the person to really uh, calm down enough, then we do what we call a show of force, which is we have other people just come and stand by. We don't put hands on, we don't restrain. If it gets to that, we're calling Seattle police. Um, but, but what you really want to do is understand that for the most part, the person is speaking out of frustration or fear or some other thing that if you can begin to talk to them in a very modulated, quiet voice, you do that. There are times that people escalate with me in a room in which I say, you know, you're really upset. I'm going to step out for five minutes. And, and if you can calm down and we can have a conversation, I'll come back in. And if not, let's just do this another day. And so I, you know, we try to give people a chance to kind of calm down and, and interact. But if they can't, you really have to protect your staff and you have to protect the other patients and have them have them leave. But you really want to just kind of recognize when somebody's amping up. And honestly, in my clinic, the people who recognize it as my front desk staff, they'll often call back and say, you know, your patient's in here and he's not doing very well and he's kind of escalating, at which point I'll come out and we'll try to see what we can do to, to get the situation back under control. Any other questions? All right, thank you.